Disc 4. Feminine and triple rhymes. Most words rhyme on their beat, on their stressed syllable. A weak ending doesn't have to be rhymed. It can stay the same in both words. We saw this in Bo Peep with find them behind them. The lightly scudded them is left alone. We wouldn't employ the rhymes mind gem or kind stem. Beating rhymes happily with meeting. You would not rhyme it with sweet thing or feet swing. Apart from anything else, you would wrench the rhythm. This much is obvious. Such rhymes, beating, heating, battle, cattle, rhyming, chiming, station, nation, are called feminine. We heard the melteth and pelteth in Keats's fancy, and they naturally occur where any metric line has a weak ending, as in Shakespeare's 20th sonnet. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted, hast thou the master mistress of my passion. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. And we encountered alternating feminine and masculine endings in Kipling's If. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. It is the stressed syllables that rhyme. There is nothing more you need to know about feminine rhyming. You will have known this instinctively from all the songs and rhymes and poems you have ever heard and seen. As a rule, the more complex and polysyllabic rhymes become, the more comic the result. In a poem mourning the death of a beloved, you would be unlikely to rhyme potato cake with I hate to bake, or spatula with bachelor, for example. Three-syllable rhymes are almost always ironic, mock-heroic, comic, or facetious in effect. In fact, I can't think of any that are not. They are also known as triple rhyme, or struciolo, from the Italian word meaning slippery downslope, and used for a kind of glib Italian dactylic rhyme. There is a Struciolo dei Pitti in Florence, a sloping lane leading down to the Pitti Palace. I once had a bun there. Byron was a master of these rhymes. Here are some examples from Don Juan. But, O oh, ye lords and ladies intellectual, inform us truly, have they not henpecked you all? He learned the arts of riding, fencing, gunnery, and how to scale a fortress or a nunnery. Since in a way that's rather of the oddest, he became divested of his modesty, that there are months which nature grows more merry in, March has its hairs, and May must have its heroine. I've got new mythological machinery and very handsome supernatural scenery. He even manages quadruple rhyme, so that their plan and prosody are eligible unless, like Wordsworth, they prove unintelligible. Auden mimics this kind of feminine and triple rhyming in, appropriately enough, his Letter to Lord Byron, is Brighton still as proud of her pavilion, and is it safe for girls to travel pillion? To those who live in Warrington or Wigan, it's not a white lie, it's a whacking biggin. Clearer than Scarfell Pike, my heart has stamped on the view from Birmingham to Wolverhampton. Such, often annoyingly forced and arch rhyming, is sometimes called Hudibrastic, after Samuel Butler's Hudibras, the 17th century poet Samuel Butler, not the 19th century novelist of the same name a mock heroic verse satire on Cromwell and Puritanism, which includes a great deal of dreadful rhyming of this kind. There was an ancient sage philosopher that had read Alexander Ross over. So lawyers, lest the bear defendant and plaintiff dog should make an endant. Hudibras also offers this stimulating example of assonance rhyming. And though his countrymen, the Huns, did stew their meat between their bums. Rich rhyme. The last species worthy of attention is rich rhyme, from the French rime riche. I find it rather horrid, but you should know that essentially it is either the rhyming of identical words that are different in meaning, homonyms, as in rich rhyme is legal, tender and quite sound, when words of different meaning share a sound. When neatly done the technique's fine, when crassly done your copper fine. Or it is the rhyming of words that sound the same, but are different in spelling and meaning, homophones. Rich rhyming's neither fish nor fowl, the sight is grim, the sound is foul. John Milton said with solemn weight, they also serve who stand and wait. Technically, there is a third kind, where the words are identical in appearance, but neither the same in sound or meaning, which results in a kind of rich eye rhyme. 
he took a shot across his bow from an archer with a bow. As a rule, feminine rich rhymes are less offensive to eye and ear for most of us than full-on monosyllabic rich rhymes. Thus, you are likely to find yourself using produce, induce, motion, promotion, and so on much more frequently than the more wince-worthy made, made, where it's M-A-I-D and M-A-D-E, nose, nose, as in K-N-O-W-S and N-O-S-E, and so on. A whole poem in rich rhyme? Thomas Hood, a Victorian poet noted for his gamesome use of puns and verbal tricks, wrote this, a first attempt in rhyme. It includes a cheeky rich rhyme triplet on burns. Oh, and height is an archaic word for called, as in named, a poet height Thomas Hood. If I were used to writing verse, and had a muse not so perverse, but prompt at fancy's call to spring, and carol like a bird in spring, or like a bee in summer time that hums about a bed of thyme, and gathers honey and delights from every blossom where it lights. If I, alas, had such a muse to touch the reader or amuse, and breathe the true poetic vein, this page should not be filled in vain. But ah, the power was never mine to dig for gems in fancy's mine, or wander over land and main to seek the fairy's old domain to watch Apollo while he climbs his throne in oriental climes, or mark the gradual dusky veil drawn over Tempe's tuneful veil. In classic lays remembered long, such flights to bolder wings belong, to bards who on that glorious height of sun and song, Parnassus height, partake the divine fire that burns in Milton Pope and Scottish Burns, who sang his native brays and burns, for me, a novice strange and new, who ne'er such inspiration knew, to weave a verse with travail sore, ordained to creep and not to soar, a few poor lines alone I write, fulfilling thus a lonely rite, not met to meet the critic's eye, for oh, to hope from such as I, for anything that's fit to read, were trusting to a broken reed. Rhyming Arrangements the convention used when describing rhyme schemes is literally as simple as A, B, C. The first rhyme of a poem is A, the second B, the third C, and so on. Here's John Donne's sonnet, At the Round World's Imagined Corners. At the round earth's imagined corners blow your trumpets, angels, and arise, arise from death your numberless infinities of souls, and to your scattered bodies go, A, B, B, A. All whom the flood did, and fire shall earth throw, all whom war, dearth, age, agues, tyrannies, despair, law, chance hath slain, and you whose eyes shall behold God, and never taste death's woe, A, B, B, A. But let them sleep, Lord, and me mourn a space, for if above all these my sins abound, tis late to ask abundance of thy grace when we are there, here on this lowly ground. C, D, C, D. Teach me how to repent, for that's as good as if thou had sealed my pardon with thy blood. E, E. This particular A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, E, E arrangement is a hybrid of the Petrarchan and Shakespearean sonnets rhyme schemes, of which more later. As to the descriptions of these layouts, well, that's simple enough. There are four very common forms. There is the couplet, so long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. And the triplet, what flocks of critics hover here today as vultures wait on armies for their prey, or gaping for the carcass of a play. In the poetry of the Augustan period, Dryden, Johnson, Swift, Pope, etc., you will often find triplets, like the one you've just heard from the prologue to Dryden's tragedy All for Love, braced on the page in one of those long curly brackets. Such braced triplets will usually hold a single thought and conclude with a full stop. Next is cross rhyming which rhymes alternating lines, A, B, A, B, etc. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. 
Finally, there is envelope rhyme, where a couplet is enveloped or enveloped by an outer rhyming pair, A, B, B, A, Abba, as in the first eight lines of the Dunn poem, or this stanza from Tennyson's In Memoriam. The yule log sparkled keen with frost, no wing of wind the region swept, but over all things brooding slept the quiet sense of something lost. Naturally, there are variations on these schemes. Wordsworth ends each cross rhyme stanza of daffodils with a couplet, for example, A, B, B, A, C, C. The world of formal rhyme schemes awaits our excited inspection in the next chapter. But without delving into neurolinguistics and the deeper waters of academic prosody, I really do not believe there is much more we need to know about rhyming in the technical sense. We have met all the types we're likely to meet and seen ways in which they may be arranged. The questions that concern us next are how and why. I've already addressed the idea of rhyme as a connective, unifying force in poems, but it is worth considering the obvious point that rhyme uses language, or is, I should say, exclusive to language. Paint can evoke landscape, sculpture the textures of physical form, but neither of these modes of expression has rhyme available to them, save in some metaphorical sense. Music, like verse, can do rhythm, but it is only poetry that can yoke words together in rhyme, sometimes, of course, and aboriginally, at the service of music. Rhyme may not be a defining condition of poetry, but poetry is pretty much a defining condition of rhyme. If poets shun rhyme, they are closing themselves off from one of the few separate and special techniques available to them, and that, in my estimation, is foolishly prodigal. Not all my poetry is in rhyme, but sometimes, and I cannot always be certain at the time why this should be, rhyming seems right and natural for a poet. It is more than likely that this will hold true in your work, too. One of the great faults we amateur poets are prey to is lazy and pointless rhyming. If a poem is not to rhyme, then it seems to me very silly indeed arbitrarily to introduce rhymes from time to time, with no apparent thought, but apparently because a natural rhyme has come up at that moment. So let us now consider good and bad rhyming, or convincing and unconvincing rhyming, if you prefer. Deferred success rhyming, as those nervous of the word failure would have us say. Good and bad rhyme. There are two issues to consider when rhyming. Firstly, and most clearly, there is the need to avoid hackneyed rhyme pairs. For the past 700 years, poets have been rhyming love with dove, moon with june, girl with curl, and boy with joy. Certain rhymes are so convenient and appropriate that their use had already become stale by the mid-1700s. Alexander Pope was fierce on the subject of bad rhymers in his An Essay on Criticism. While they ring round the same unvaried chimes With sure returns of still-expected rhymes, Where'er you find the cooling western breeze, In the next line it whispers through the trees. If crystal streams with pleasing murmurs creep, The readers threatened, not in vain, with sleep. Night, light, sight, death, breath, and cherish, perish, might be included in that list. The poor old word love, a natural subject for poetry if ever there was one, offers very few rhyme choices in English. Frances Cornford, in To a Fat Lady Seen from the Train, did her best. Oh, why do you walk through the fields in gloves, missing so much and so much? Oh, fat white woman whom nobody loves, why do you walk through the fields in gloves? when the grass is soft as the breast of doves and shivering sweet to the touch. Oh, why do you walk through the fields in gloves, missing so much and so much? Only the unlikely shoves could have been added. When it is a singular love, the word above becomes available, and for the cockney rhymesters amongst us there is, I suppose, gov. Of is a popular assonance, especially in songs, in written verse, you would be forced either to run the word on with an enjambment, which is likely to make it overstressed and clumsy, or to resort to this kind of stale formulation. You're the one I love, the one I'm dreaming of. Hate, so much easier. If 
If there is a rule for rhyming, I suppose it is that, save in comic verse or for some other desired effect, it should usually be, if not invisible, then natural, transparent, seamless, discreet and unforced. The reader should not feel that a word has been chosen simply because it rhymes. Very often, let us not pretend otherwise, words are chosen for precisely that reason. But ars est calare artem, the art lies in the concealment of art. So, two blindingly obvious points. Avoid the obvious pairs. Strive not to draw attention to a rhyme. Trying to mint fresh rhymes and being transparent and uncontrived in one's rhyming may seem like contradictory aims. Therein lies the art, of course. But if one guideline has to be sacrificed, then for my preference it should certainly be the first. Better to go for a traditional rhyme pair than draw unnecessary attention to an unusual one. Both rules, like any, can of course be broken so long as you know what you are doing and why. If you want an ugly rhyme, it is no less legitimate than a dissonance and discord might be in music. Horrific in the wrong hands, of course, but by no means unconscionable. Talk of the wrong hands leads us to pathology. It is a deep and important truth that humankind's knowledge advances further when we look not at success, but at failure. Disease reveals more than health ever can. We would never have understood, for example, how the brain or the liver worked, were it not for them going wrong from time to time. They are not, after all, machines whose function is revealed by an intelligent inspection of their mechanisms. They are composed of unrevealing organic spongy matter whose function would be impossible to determine by dissection and examination alone. But when there is injury, disease or congenital defect, you can derive some clue as to their purpose by noticing what goes wrong with the parts of the body they control. A trauma or tumour in an area of the brain that causes the patient to fall over, for example, might suggest to a neurologist that this is the area that controls balance and mobility. In the same way, rhyming can be shown to control the balance and mobility of a poem, doing much more than simply providing us with a linked concord of sounds. There is no better way to demonstrate this than by taking a look at some diseased rhyming. Thus far, almost all the excerpts we have scrutinised have been more or less healthy specimens of poetry. We did lend an ear to a couplet from Keats's Lamia, Till she saw him as once she passed him by, where against a column he leant thoughtfully. There was not much doubt in our minds, I think, that this was a triumph neither of rhyme nor metre. In such a long poem, we decided, or at least I maintain, this was not a terminal problem. We questioned, too, William Blake's prosodic skill in lines like, A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. We forgave him also. It is time now to go further down this path and compare two poems from approximately the same era treating approximately the same themes. One is a healthy specimen, the other very sick indeed. A thought experiment. Your task is to imagine yourself as a Victorian poet, whiskered and wise. You have two poems to write. Each will commemorate a disaster. At approximately 7.15 on the stormy night of Sunday the 28th of December 1879, with a howling wind blowing down from the Arctic, the high central navigation girders of the Tay Railway Bridge collapsed into the Firth of Tay at Dundee, taking with them a locomotive, six carriages and 75 souls. Original estimates projected a death toll of 90 on their way from Edinburgh to Dundee for Hogmanay. It was a disaster of the first magnitude, the Titanic of its day. The bridge had been open for less than 20 months and been pronounced perfectly sound by the Board of Trade, whose subsequent inquiry determined that a lack of buttressing was at fault. As with all such calamities, this one threatened a concomitant collapse in national self-confidence. To this day, the event stands as the worst structural failure in British engineering history. In this poem, you, a Victorian poet, are going to tell the story in rhyming verse. The idea is not a contemplative or personal take on the vanity of human enterprise, fate, mankind's littleness when pitted against the might of nature, or any other such private rumination. This is to be the verse equivalent 
of a public memorial. As a public poem, it should not be too long, but of appropriate length for recitation. How do you embark upon the creation of such a work? You get out your notebook and consider some of the words that are likely to be needed. Rhyme words are of great importance since, by definition, they form the last words of each line. The repetition of their sounds would be crucial to the impact of your poem. They need, therefore, to be words central to the story and its meaning. Let us look at our options. Well, the river Tay is clearly a chief player in the drama. Tay, say, day, clay, away, dismay, and dozens of others available. No real problems there. Bridge. Hmm, not so easy. Ridge is possible, but doesn't seem relevant. Plenty of midges in Scotland, but again, hardly suitable for our purposes. Fridges have not yet been invented. The word carriage, marvellously useful as it might be, would have to be wrenched into carriage, so that's a non-starter too. Girders offers murders, but that seems a bit unjust. Sir Thomas Bouch, the British chief engineer, may have been incompetent, but he was scarcely homicidal. Dundee... Mm -hmm. C, 3, B, D, we, flee, key, divorcee, employee, goatee, catastrophe. Mm, the last, while excellently apposite, might lose some of its power with a slight extra push needed on the last syllable for a proper rhyme. Catastrophe. Ditto calamity. Pity. 1879? Well, there are rhymes aplenty there. Fine, brine, wine, mine, thine, railway line, even. Now, that does suggest possibilities. Other useful rhymes might be river, quiver, shiver, train, strain, rain, drown, down, town, perhaps, collapse, snaps, and so on. I hope this gives an idea of the kind of thought processes involved. Of course, I'm not suggesting that in praxis any poet will approach a poem quite in this manner. Much of these thoughts will come during the trial and error of the poem's development. I'm not going to ask you to write the whole poem, though you might like to do so for your own satisfaction. The idea is to consider the elements that will go into the construction of such a work, paying special attention to the rhyming. We should now try penning a few lines and phrases as a kind of preliminary sketch. The bridge that spans the river Tay. For bridges are iron, but man is clay. The steaming train, the teeming rain, stress and strain, the girders sigh, the cables quiver, the troubled waters of the river. Locked forever in the deeps, the mighty broken engine sleeps. So frail the life of mortal man, how fragile seems the human span. How narrow then, how weak its girth, the bridge between our death and birth. Nothing very original or startling here. Human clay is a very tired old cliché, as is stress and strain. Girth and birth don't seem to be going anywhere, but with some tweaking and whittling, a poem could perhaps emerge from beneath our toiling fingers. See now if you can come up with four or five couplets, rhyming snatches or phrases of a similar nature. Do not try and write in modern English. You are a Victorian, remember. When you have done that, we can proceed. How did you do? Well enough to be driven on to complete a few verses? As it happens, and as perhaps you already knew from the moment I mentioned the River Tay, a poem was written on this very catastrophe by William McGonagall, Sir William Topaz McGonagall, Knight of the White Elephant Burma, a title conferred by King Tibor of Burma and the Andaman Islands in 1894, Burma's last monarch. Sadly, many believe this was one of many cruel hoaxes perpetrated on the unfortunate poet. The Tay Bridge disaster remains the work for which he is best known, his masterpiece, if you will. I am too kind to you and to his memory to recite the entire work. Beautiful railway bridge of the silvery Tay. Alas, I am very sorry to say that ninety lives have been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. It was about seven o'clock at night, and the wind it blew with all its might, and the rain came pouring down, and the dark cloud seemed to frown, and the demon of the air seemed to say, I'll blow down the bridge of Tay. When the train left Edinburgh, the passengers' hearts were light and felt no sorrow. 
But Boreas blew a terrific gale, which made their hearts for to quail. And many of the passengers with fear did say, I hope God will send us safe across the bridge of Tay. So the train sped on with all its might, and Bonnie Dundee soon hove in sight, and the passengers' hearts felt light, thinking they would enjoy themselves on the new year with their friends at home they loved most dear, and wish them all a happy new year. I must now conclude my lay by telling the world, fearlessly without the least dismay, that your central guarders would not have given way, at least many sensible men do say, had they been supported on each side with buttresses, at least many sensible men confesses, for the stronger we our houses do build, the less chance we have of being killed. Almost everything that can go wrong with a poem has gone wrong here. One might argue that McGonagall has brilliantly memorialized a doomed and structurally flawed bridge in congruently doomed and structurally flawed verse. His poem is a disaster for a disaster. It is the Tay Bridge, crashing hopelessly to its destruction and dragging every innocent word with it. It is not buttressed by metre, rhyme, sense or reason, and even as we read it, we feel it collapse under the weight of its own absurdity and ineptitude. I will not linger long on why it fails so spectacularly. It must surely be apparent to you. The metre, of course, is all over the place, even if this were accentually written like a music hall turn, folk ballad or other non-syllabic rhythmic verse. There is no discernible pattern of three-stress, four-stress or five-stress rhythm at work. The poem is arbitrarily laid out in stanzas of five, six, six, five, six, eight, nine and thirteen lines, which create no expectations to fulfil or withhold. This, in part, contributes to its overall narrative slackness. We have lots of Tay rhymes, say, midway, dismay, lay, bray. There are night, might, sight and moonlight, known, blown, down, frown, gale, quail and build, kill. There is, however, excruciating para-rhyme laid on for our pleasure. Edinburgh felt no sorrow, forces a rather American Edinburgh pronunciation or else sorrow for sorrow. Buttresses confesses will never be a happy pair, nor is the repeated 79 time assonance at all successful. If you're going to assonate, much better to do it within the verse, not on the last line of a stanza, as we heard in the Zephaniah poem. The archaic expletives, metrical fillers and inversions, did say and do build for said and build, and their hearts for to quail are not pleasant. The wind it blew is a common enough formulation in ballads trying to get round the problem of the lack of a weak syllable between wind and blue, the rain it raineth every day and so on, but cannot be considered a satisfactory phrase in a serious poem, nor do such archaisms as hove for came and lay for song please the reader. It is, of course, the sheer banality that lives longest in the mind, however, and most contributes to our sense of this being such a tour de farce. This banality mostly derives from McGonagall's word choice, what is known as poetic diction, and word choice is shown here to be most pitifully at the mercy of rhyme. It is not only the rhyming words themselves that are at fault, but the phrases and syntax used in order to reach those rhyme words not to mention the accidental and gruesome internal rhyme, Sabbath Day, in line four of stanza one. With his rhyming alone, McGonagall has already sabotaged his poem. A perfectly fine piece might in other hands have been worked up from the full rhyme pairs he found, night, might, etc., and from the perfectly laudable sentiments he expresses, but a committee comprising Shakespeare, Milton, Tennyson, Frost, Auden and Larkin could do little with those unfortunate para-rhymes. As it happens, Gerard Manley Hopkins had already composed another disaster poem, his The Wreck of the Deutschland, exactly four years earlier. It was written to commemorate the deaths of five Franciscan nuns who lost their lives at sea in 1875. Into the snows she sweeps, hurling the haven behind. The Deutschland on Sunday and so the sky keeps, for the infinite air is unkind, and the sea flint flake 
black-backed in the regular blow, sitting east-northeast in cursed quarter the wind, wiry and white fiery, and whirlwind swivel its snow, spins to the widow-making, unchilding, unfathering deeps. That splendid last line has spawned the popular kenning widow-maker to describe the sea, and latterly by extension vessels of the deep, as in the Hollywood movie K-19, The Widow-Maker. Wiry and white fiery work well as internal rhyme, together with all the usual head rhymes, assonances and consonances we expect from Hopkins. Otherwise, he uses the fairly neutral and simple sweeps, keeps, deeps, blow, snow and behind kind. He nestles the eye rhyme wind into the quarter wiry white alliteration and he doesn't stand out as too ugly. Mind you, there is some less than comfortable rhyming elsewhere in the poem. Stanza 15 contains this unfortunate internal rhyme, and frightful the nightfall folded rueful a day. Frightful indeed, to our ears at least, but perhaps frightful was not such a trivial word in 1875. Some three and a half decades later, the loss of the Titanic inspired Thomas Hardy's The Convergence of the Twain. Here are stanzas 8 to 11. And as the smart ship grew, in stature, grace, and hue, in shadowy, silent distance grew the iceberg, too. Alien they seemed to be, no mortal eye could see the intimate welding of their later destiny, or sign that they were bent by paths coincident on being anon twin halves of one august event, till the spinner of the years says now, and each one hears, and consummation comes, and jars two hemispheres. While I yield to none in my admiration of Hardy, I do not believe this to be his finest work. The characteristic obsession with the spinner of the years, the imminent will that stirs and urges everything, he calls it in an earlier Alexandrian in the same poem, or the president of the immortals, in his deathless phrase from Tess of the D'Urbervilles, gives the whole an appropriate sense of imminent, inexorable doom which is, of course, its very subject, as we know from the title, but they were bent by paths coincident is not very happy, nor is being anon twin halves of one august event. August seems an almost comically inappropriate word for such a tragedy, and anon smells very dated in a poem written just two years before T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and indeed in the very same year that Ezra Pound and others were founding the Imagist movement. All in all, it's a surprisingly flawed poem from so fine a poet, and it is partly the rhyming that makes it so. In stanza eight, the word hue is manifestly used only to go with grew. The image of the iceberg growing was so important to the central idea of the poem that Hardy could not resist the rhyme. But what was so special about the hue of the Titanic? Its red funnel? You could argue, I suppose, that in such a monochrome world as the North Atlantic, Anything man-made would seem colourful, but really it is clear that the word is a doubt chosen primarily for its rhyme. Also unattractively primitive is the internal rhyme in the Alexandrine in shadowy silent distance grew the iceberg too. In the following stanza, the slight wrenching of destiny can hardly be counted a wonderful success either. Infelicitous rhyming triplets in stanzas omitted here include meant, opulent, indifferent, and see vanity she. Nonetheless, it is clearly a whole continent better as verse than poor old McGonagall's effort. There is effortless metrical consistency. There is a scheme, three line stanzas, rhyming triplets, the last of which is an Alexandrian. For all its less than technically superior rhyming, and therefore word choices or diction, it is at least memorable, grave, and thoroughly thought through. Now for the second disaster poem that you, the Victorian poet, must write. The year is 1854, and you are Britain's Poet Laureate. Alfred Lord Tennyson has just unexpectedly resigned the post, so it is now your patriotic duty to write a poem about a disastrous British cavalry charge that has just taken place on the peninsula that lies between the Ukraine and the Black Sea. Due to some monstrous error, an officer, Captain Newland, has galloped down from the Causeway Heights above the Balaclava Plain, pointing with his sabre at the Russian battery in the valley below, yelling, There are your guns! Charge them! Or words to that effect. 
according at least to the report by W. H. Russell in the Times that you, along with the rest of the nation, have just read with added horror. Those were not, in fact, the guns that Lord Cardigan, his commanding officer, had meant at all. The whole thing has been a catastrophic cock-up from start to finish. A cock-up, but a gallant one. Disraeli has just told the packed and stunned House of Commons that it was a feat of chivalry, fiery with consummate courage and bright with flashing courage. Of the 673 mounted officers and men of the 13th Light Dragoons, 17th Lancers and 11th Hussars, a cavalry troop collectively known as the Light Brigade, 157 have lost their lives. Nothing was achieved. A military disaster as traumatic and tragic for the nation as the collapse of the Tay Bridge was to be in 25 years' time. Your mission, then, is to write up the debacle into a poem that will tell the story, sum up the public mood, and stand as a worthy memorial to the brave dead. What do you do? What sort of preparatory scribbles do you make in your poet's notebook? As for meter, short lines, you decide. Falling rhythms of dactyls and trochies would be a good choice, echoing the fierceness and rush of the action and suggesting the cadences of a bugle sounding the charge. tum da da tum da da tum da da dum da tum da da tum da da tum da da dum That sort of effect. But as for rhymes, hmm. Hussar is a bummer. Only para-rhymes seem to fit. Bizarre, bozar, faux pas, disbar, ajar, papa, and hurrah. Might do at a pinch, but they hardly promise suitably solemn material. Besides, the plural hussars excludes at least half of them. Lancers is okay. Dancers, prancers, answers. Some suggestive possibilities there. Dragoons is, if anything, worse than hussars. Lagoons seems to be the only proper rhyme. The slant rhyme raccoon is unlikely to come in handy. Nor are jejoon, cartoon, and baboon, one feels. Brigade is better, much better. Made, invade, fade, raid, dismayed, laid. All words that might offer some connection with the subject matter. Russian? Mm, there's Prussian, which has no relevance. Otherwise, there are only bad para-rhymes available. Um, hushing, cushion, pushing. Horses gives the rather obvious forces and courses, while steeds offers deeds. Off on their galloping steeds, praise for their marvellous deeds. Mm, bit lame. Rhymes for guns might come in handy. Buns, mm, runs, sons, huns. Shame the enemy of Ruskies. Stuns, shuns, hmm, come back to that later. 673, hmm, simply too long, a whole three-beat line used up. 673, charging to victory. And it isn't a victory, it's a terrible defeat. 673, charging for queen and country. Oh, what a wonder to see, marvellous gallantry, 673. This is dreadful. 673, it sounds too perky and too literal at the same time. Should we round it up or down? 600 or 700? 100 doesn't rhyme with much, though. Oh, hang on, there are some good slant rhymes here. Thundered, sundered, blundered, wondered, onward. Onward, light brigade, onward. Onward, you splendid 600. There are the guns to raid. Charge them, brave Nolan said. On rode the light brigade, not knowing that Nolan had blundered. It's getting there. The accidental consonance assonance of knowing Nolan is inelegant, but a bit of a polish, and who knows? Your turn now. See if you can come up with some phrases with that metre and those rhyme words, or ones close to them. Well, as you probably know, Tennyson did not retire from his laureateship, and this is what he came up with to mark the calamity. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death, rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply, there's not to reason why, there's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death 
Into the mouth of hell rode the six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the light brigade. Noble six hundred. Naturally, I cannot tell how Tennyson embarked upon the preparation and composition of his poem. Quite possibly, he charged, as it were, straight in. Maybe the rhythm and some of the phrasing came to him in the bath or while walking. It's possible that he made notes not unlike those we've just made, or that the work emerged whole in one immediate and perfect Mozartian stream. We shall never know. What we can agree upon, I hope, is that the rhyming is perfect. Shell, hell, brigade, maid, dismayed, and the wondered, blundered, thundered, sundered, hundred onward group work together superbly. A small nucleus of rhyming words like this throughout one poem can set up a pattern of expectation in the listener's or reader's ear. Thundered is close to onomatopoeic. It seems somehow more than just descriptive of thunder, it actually seems to mimic it. And those thunderous qualities are in turn passed on to its rhyme partners, lending a power and force to wondered and hundred that they would not otherwise possess. The rhyming, quite as much as the rhythm, helps generate all the pity, pride and excitement for which the poem is renowned. We do know that in writing this, Tennyson created a rod for the back of all subsequent British poets laureate who have struggled in vain to come up with anything that so perfectly captures an important moment in the nation's history. It was perhaps the last great public poem written in England, the verse equivalent of Land of Hope and Glory. It's a hoary old war horse to our ears now, I suppose, as much as a result of social change as literary. Most modern readers, academic, poetic or amateur, would probably feel that Hopkins and Hardy engage our sensibilities more directly than Tennyson, in the same way that, for all their technical mastery, we are less moved by the painters of the mid-Victorian period than by the later Impressionists and post-Impressionists. Nonetheless, there is always much to be learned from virtuosity, and I disbelieve any poet who does not confess that he would give even unto half his wealth to have come up with theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. We should recognize that Tennyson's is a poem written for the nation, while the Hopkins and Hardy are essentially inward-looking. Indeed, the wreck of the Deutschland is much more an autobiographical contemplation of the poet's religious development than a commemoration of a shipwreck. Whatever our feelings, we can surely acknowledge that Tennyson's versifying is magnificent. It is pleasingly typical, at all events, that this, the best-known poem we have on the military theme, memorializes failure. There are no stirring odes celebrating Agincourt, Waterloo, Trafalgar, or the Battle of Britain in our popular anthologies. No English verse equivalent of the 1812 overture for us to cheer at and weep over. Earlier on the morning of that same October day in 1854, on the same Crimean battlefield, the Heavy Brigade had fought a supremely successful battle during which more men died than in the later disaster. They were just as gallant, but their heroism goes unremembered, despite Tennyson writing a poem about their charge too, the charge of the gallant 300, the Heavy Brigade. Don't milk it, Alfie, love. Misfortune? Failure and incompetence remain our great themes. It is probable that without the poem, the Light Brigade's futile charge would have vanished into history. Amongst the many books on the subject, there are works whose titles and subtitles include Honour the Charge They Made, Noble 600, Do or Die, Into the Valley of Death, The Reason Why, The Real Reason Why, and Someone Had Blundered. Not many poems I can think of have so completely caught the public attention or forever defined our understanding of a historical event. Anyway, I hope I have convinced you that in great part it is the rhyming that has contributed to this immortality. Tennyson's discovery of the hundred blundered, wondered, thundered group is the heart of the poem, its engine. It may strike you as trivial or even unsettling to discuss rhyming options in such detail. I know exactly how you feel and we should address this. We must be honest about the undoubted embarrassment attendant upon the whole business of rhyming. Whatever we may feel about rhymed poetry, it's somehow shaming to talk about our search for rhyming words. It's so banal, so mechanistic, so vulgar to catch oneself chanting 
ace, race, chase, space, face, case, grace, base, brace, dace, lace, when surely a proper poet should be thinking high, pure thoughts, nailing objective correlatives, pondering metaphysical insights, observing delicate nuances in nature and the human heart, sifting gold from grit in the swift-running waters of language and soliciting the muse on the upper slopes of Parnassus. Well, yes, but a rhyme is a rhyme and won't come unless searched for. Wordsworth and Shakespeare, Milton and Yeats, Auden and Chaucer have all been there before us, screwing up their faces as they recite words that only share that sound, that chime, that rhyme. To search for a rhyme is no more demeaning than to search for a harmony at the piano by flattening this note or that, and no more vulgar than mixing paints on a palette before applying them to the canvas. It is one of the things we do. Rhyming practice. Poetry consists in a rhyming dictionary and things. Gertrude Stein. On that head, should you use a rhyming dictionary? I must confess that I do, but only as a last resort. They can be frustrating and cumbersome. They can break concentration. They offer no help with assonance or consonance rhymes, and are too crammed with irrelevant words like multicollinearity and cordwainer and eutectic. Something to do with melting points, apparently. Or types of Malayan cheese and Albanian nose flutes, which are never going to be of the least use to one's poetry. I prefer, first, simply to chant the sound to myself in the rhythm the words need to fit. If that doesn't bear fruit, I will write all the letters of the alphabet at the top of a page and then go through the permutations one by one. It's easy enough to find monosyllabic masculine rhymes. They get harder to pop into your mind when you try to think of their compound versions, the various syllables that can precede the word. For boy, words like joy, toy, soy, cloy, Coy, ploy, slip into the mind quite quickly. Employ, deploy, alloy, annoy, destroy and enjoy might take a little longer. Decoy and convoy have just occurred to me, although they would need careful use as there is a little more stress on their first syllables. And now I'm going to turn to the dictionary. Hmm. I've missed boy with a U, but that's a silly rich rhyme. Besides, it doesn't rhyme for Americans who pronounce it buoy. McCoy is there, as in the real, I suppose. Hanoi, Savoy, and Bok Choy. Strange to find two different types of cabbage. Envoy, Carboy, Bortsoy, and Viceroy are there, though I would argue that they are usually stressed on their first syllable. There are compounds of words we have already found, redeploy and overjoy. I'm very cross that I failed to find corduroy for myself, and I would like to think that given enough time, Savaloy, hobbledy hoy, and hoy polloi might have come to me unaided. The assonance rhymes, void, lloyd, freud, hoik, foil, and so on, are naturally not shown. By all means, invest in a good rhyming dictionary. There are several available from the usual publishing houses, and they're all much the same, so far as I can tell. If it is musical lyrics you're thinking of, then I would recommend Sammy Khan's The Songwriter's Rhyming Dictionary. The lyricist, who gave us high hopes and come fly with me, is full of excellent and affable advice. There's no index, however, so it will take a bit of getting used to. There are also software rhyming dictionaries available, either as standalone applications or as online resources. Personally, I feel that a poet's words are better mumbled out or scribbled on paper. Words have colour, feel, texture, density, shape, weight and personality. They are, I've said this before, all we have. Deeply dippy about most things digital I may be, but when it comes to poetry, I want the word to have been uttered with my breath and shaped by my hand. Having said which, I have invented a poetic method that utilises the provokingly silly incompetence of voice recognition software, allowing its mistakes to furnish interesting poetic ideas. It gave me Power Monkey for Poet Monkey recently. Such aleatory assistance can be suggested. Poetry Exercise 8. Your task now is to discover as many rhymes as you can for the word girl. My rhyming dictionary offers 24, many of which are absurd dialect words. As many syllables as you like, but obviously it is a masculine rhyme, so the earl sound will terminate each word you find. When you've done that, 
you have to do the same for the feminine rhyming Marta. The dictionary offers 28, many of which are again farcically weird. This is not Scrabble. Proper nouns, place names, foreign words, and informal language of any description all count. Ten for each would be an excellent score, but don't worry if you can't manage it. Facility and speed in the hunting down of rhyme words is hardly a sign of poetic genius. When you are finished, try this as the second part of your rhyming exercise. Take your notebook and wander about the house and garden if you have one. If you're not listening to this at home, then wander around your office, hospital ward, factory floor or prison cell. If you're outside or on a train, plane or bus, in a cafe, brothel or hotel lobby, you can still do this. Simply note down as many things as you can see, hear or smell. They need not be nouns. You can jot down processes, actions, deeds. So if you're in a cafe, you might write down smoking, steam, raincoat, lover's tiff, cappuccino machine, sipping, flapjacks, cinnamon, jazz music, spilt tea and so on. Whatever strikes the eye, ear or nose. Write a list of at least 20 words. When you've done that, Settle down and once more see how many rhymes you can come up with for each word. You may find that this simple exercise gets your poetic saliva gland so juiced up that the temptation to turn the words into poetry becomes irresistible. Yield to it. A random, accidental and arbitrary consonance of word sounds can bring inspiration where no amount of pacing, pencil chewing and looking out of the window can help. Chapter 3. Form. The Stanza. So, we can write metrically, in iams and anapists, trochees and dactyls, we can choose the length of our measure, hexameter, pentameter, tetrameter. We can write accentually, in three-stress and four-stress lines. We can alliterate and we can rhyme. But thus far, our verse has merely been stickic, presented in a sequence of lines. Where those lines terminate is determined, as we know, by the measure, or, in the case of syllabic verse, by the syllable count. Prose, such as I'm reading now, is laid out or lineated differently. As I wrote this, I had no reason to start a new line to press the return key, as it were, until it was time for a new paragraph or a quotation. Our first clue that the written words on a page might qualify as poetry may indeed be offered by lineation. But an even more obvious indicator is the existence of stanzas. The word derives from the Italian for stand, which in turn developed into the word for room. Stanza di pranzo is dining room, for example. In everyday speech, in songwriting, hymn singing, and many other popular genres, a stanza will often be referred to as a verse, meaning turn, as in reverse, subvert, diversion, and so on. I will be keeping to the word stanza, allowing me to use verse in its looser sense of poetic material generally. Also, I like the image of a poem being a house divided into rooms. Some traditional verse forms have no stanzaic layout. For others, it's almost their defining feature. But first, we need to go deeper into this whole question of form. What is form and why bother with it? Stephen gets all cross. By form, just so that we're clear, we mean the defining structure of a genre or type. When we say formal, the word should not be thought of as bearing any connotations of stiffness, starchiness, coldness or distance. Formal, for our purposes, simply means of form, morphological, if you like. In music, some examples of form would be sonata, concerto, symphony, fugue and overture. In television, Common forms include sitcom, soap, documentary, miniseries, chat show, and single drama. Over the years, docudramas, drama docs, mockumentaries, and a host of other variations and subcategories have emerged. Form can be undermined, hybridized, and stretched almost to breaking point. Poetic forms, too, can be crossbred, subverted, made sport of, mutilated, sabotaged, and rebelled against. But here is the point. If there is no suggestion of an overall scheme at work in the first place, then there is nothing to subvert or undermine. A whole world of possibilities closed off to you. 
Yes, you can institute your own structures. You can devise new forms or create a wholly original poetic manner and approach. But there are at least three major disadvantages to this. Firstly, it's all too often a question of reinventing the wheel. All the trial and error discoveries and setbacks that poetic wheelwrights have undergone over two millennia to be caught up with in one short lifetime. Secondly, and this flows from the first point, it is fantastically difficult and lonely. Thirdly, it requires the reader to know what you are up to. Since human beings first sang, recited and wrote, they have been developing ways of structuring and presenting their verse. Most readers of poetry, whether they are aware of it or not, are instinctively familiar with the elemental forms. For a practicing poet to be ignorant of them is foolish at best, perverse and bloody-minded at worst. We can all surely admit, without sacrificing any cherished sense of our bold modernity and iconoclastic originality, that a painter is in a better position to ignore the rules of composition or perspective if he knows exactly what those rules are. Just because poems are made of our common currency words, it does not mean that poets should be denied a like grounding and knowledge. Besides, as I've emphasized before, initiation into the technique of poetry is all part of becoming a poet, and it is pleasurable. One is in the company of one's forebears. One is not alone. Ezra Pound, generally regarded as the principal founder of modernism, wrote of the need to refresh poetics. No good poetry is ever written in a manner 20 years old, he wrote in 1912, for to write in such a manner shows conclusively that the writer thinks from books, convention and cliché, not from real life. He went further, asserting that extant poetical language and modes were in fact defunct. He declared war on all existing formal structures, meter, rhyme, and genre. We should observe that he was a professor of Romance languages, devoted to medieval troubadour verse, Chinese, Japanese, Sicilian, Greek, Spanish, French, and Italian forms, and much besides. His call to free verse was not a manifesto for ignorant, self-indulgent, maundering, and uneducated anarchy. His poems are syntactically and semantically difficult laden with illusion and steeped in his profound knowledge of classical and oriental forms and culture. They are often laid out in structures that recall or exactly follow ancient forms, cantos, odes, and even, as we shall discover later, that most strict and venerable of forms, the sestina. Pound was also a Nazi sympathizing anti-Semitic antagonistic son of a bitch, as it happens. He wasn't trying to open poetry for all, to democratize verse for the kids and create a friendly, free-form world in which everyone is equal. Although, to be fair, he did repent and write, the worst mistake I made was that stupid suburban prejudice of anti-Semitism. But if the old fascist was right in determining that his generation needed to get away from the heavy manner and glutinous cliches of Victorian verse, its archaic words and reflex tricks of poetical language and all outdated modes of expression and thought in order to free itself for a new century. Is it not equally true that we need to escape from the dreary, self-indulgent, randomly lineated drivel that today passes for poetry for precisely the same reasons? After a hundred years of free verse and open field poetry, the condition of English language poetics is every bit as tattered and tired as that which Pound and his coevals inherited. People find ideas a bore, Pound wrote, because they do not distinguish between live ones and stuffed ones on a shelf. Unfortunately, the tide has turned, and now it is some of Pound's once new ideas that have been stuffed and shelved and become a bore. He wrote in 1910, The Art of Letters will come to an end before A.D. 2000. I shall survive as a curiosity. It might be tempting to agree that the art of letters has indeed come to an end, and to wonder whether a doctrinaire abandonment of healthy living forms for the sake of a dogma of stillborn originality might not have to shoulder some of the responsibility for such a state of affairs. Add a feeble-minded kind of political correctness to the mix, something Pound would certainly never have countenanced, and it is a wonder that any considerable poetry at all has been written over the last 50 years. It is as if we have been encouraged to believe that form 
is a kind of fascism, and that to acquire knowledge is to drive a jackboot into the face of those poor souls who are too incurious, dull-witted, or idle to find out what poetry can be. Surely better to use another word for such free-form meanderings. Prose therapy about covers it. Emotional masturbation, perhaps. Auto-omphiloscopy might be an acceptable coinage, gazing at one's own navel. Let us reserve the word poetry for something worth fighting for, an ideal we can strive to live up to. What then is the solution? Greeting card verse? Pastiche? For some, the answer lies in the street poetry of rap, hip-hop, reggae, and other musically derived discourses. Unfortunately, this does not suit my upbringing, temperament, and talents. I find these modes, admirable as they no doubt are, as alien to my cultural heritage and linguistic tastes as their practitioners no doubt find Browning and Betjeman, Pope, Cope, and Heaney. I will try and address this problem at the end of the audiobook. But for now, I would urge you to believe that a familiarity with form will not transform you into a reactionary bourgeois, stifle your poetic voice, imprison your emotions, cramp your style, or inhibit your language. On the contrary, it will liberate you from all of these discomforts. Nor need one discourse be adopted at the expense of another. Eclecticism is as possible in poetry as in any other art or mode of cultural expression. There are, to my mind, two aesthetics available when faced by the howling, formless, uncertain, relative and morally contingent winds that buffet us today. One is to provide verse of like formlessness and uncertainty. Another is, perhaps with conscious irony, to erect a structured shelter of form. Form is not necessarily a denial of the world's loss of faith and structure. It is by no means of necessity a nostalgic evasion. It can be, as we shall see, a defiant, playful, and wholly modern response. I am aware that you might think me a dreadful, hidebound old dinosaur. I assure you I am not. I am uncertain why I should feel the need to prove this, but I do want you to understand that I am far from contemptuous of modernism and free verse, the experimental and the avant-garde, or of the poetry of the streets. Whitman, Cummings, O'Hara, Wyndham Lewis, Eliot, Yandel, Olson, Ginsberg, Pound, and Zephaniah are poets that have given me, and continue to give me, immense pleasure. I do not despise free verse. Listen to this. Post coitum animal triste. I see you. You come closer, improvident with your coming. Then, stretched to scratch, is it a trick of the light? I see you worlded with pain, but of necessity not weeping. Cigaretted and drinked, loaded against yourself, you seem so, yes, bold, irreducible. But nuded and after-loved, you are not so strong, are you? After all, there's the problem. That is precisely the kind of worthless ass dribble I am forced to read whenever I agree to judge a poetry competition. It took me under a minute and a half to write, and while I dare say you can tell what utter wank it is, there are many who would accept it as poetry. All the clichés are there. Pointless lineation, meaningless punctuation and presentation, fatuous creations of new verbs, cigaretted and drinked, worlded, nuded, after-loved. Actually, I have to confess, I quite like after-loved. A posy Latin title. Every pathology is presented. Like so much of what passes for poetry today, it is also listless, utterly drained of energy and drive. A common problem with much contemporary art but an especial problem with poetry that chooses to close itself off from all metrical pattern and form. It's like music without beat or shape or harmony. Not music at all, in fact. Writing free verse is like playing tennis with the net down, Robert Frost wrote. Not much of a game at all, really. Incidentally, on the off chance that you have submitted a poem for any competition that I have judged or plan to in the future, Please don't think that I will condemn a poem to the bin because it is in free verse, or raise one to the top of the pile because it is formal. A good free verse poem is better than a bad sonnet, and vice versa. My poem is also pretentious. 
pretentious in exactly the way much hotel cooking is pretentious, aping the modes of seriously innovative culinary artists and trusting that the punters will be fooled. Ooh, it's got a lavender reduction and a sorrel jus. It's a pavan of mullet with an infusion of green tea and papaya. Bollocks, give me steak and kidney pudding. Real haute cuisine is created by those who know what they're doing. Learning meter and form and other such techniques is the equivalent of understanding culinary ingredients, how they're grown, how they're prepared, how they taste, how they combine. Then, and only then, is one fit to experiment with new forms. It begins with love, an absolute love of eating and of the grain and particularity of food. It is first expressed in the drudgery of chopping onions and preparing the daily stockpots, in the commitment to work and concentration. They won't let you loose on anything more creative until you have served this apprenticeship. I venerate great chefs like Heston Blumenthal, Richard Corrigan and Gordon Ramsay. They are the real thing. They have done the work, work of an intensity most of us would balk at. Of course, some people think that they, Blumenthal, Corrigan et al, are pretentious. But here, such thinking derives from a fundamental ignorance and fear. So much easier to say that everything you fail to understand is pretentious than to learn to discriminate between the authentic and the fraudulent. Between lazy indiscipline and frozen traditionalism, there lies a thrilling space where the living, the fresh, and the new may be discovered. Fortunately, practicing meter and verse forms is not as laborious, repetitive, and frightening as toiling in a kitchen under the eye of a tyrannical chef. But we should never forget that poetry, like cooking, derives from love, an absolute love for the particularity and grain of ingredients. In our case, words. So, rant over. Let us acquaint ourselves with some of the poetic forms that have developed and evolved over the centuries. The most elemental way in which lineation could be taken forward is through the collection of lines into stanza form. Let us examine some options. Stanzaic variations. Open forms. Tercets, quatrains and other stanzas. Terza rima, ottava rima, rubaiyat, rhyme royal, the Spenserian stanza. A tercet is a stanza of three lines. Quatrains come in fours, cinquains in five, sextains in sixes. That much is obvious. There are, however, specific formal requirements for proper cinquains or sextains written in the French manner. There is, for example, a sextain form more commonly called the sestina, which we will examine in a separate section. Forms which follow a set pattern are called closed forms. The haiku, limerick and sonnet would be examples of single stanza closed forms. Forms which leave the overall length of a poem up to the poet are called open forms. Terza rima. Tercets, three-line stanzas, can be independent entities, rhyming A, B, A, C, D, C, and so on. Or they might demand a special kind of interlocking scheme, such as can be found in terza rima, the form in which Dante wrote Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. The terza rima mode is very fine. Great Dante used it for his famous text. It rhymes the words in every other line, with each thought drawing you towards the next. A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D. This middle rhyme is sequently annexed to form the outer rhymes of stanza three, and thus we make an interlocking rhyme. This subtle trick explains, at least to me, just why this form has stood the test of time. This linked rhyming can go on forever, the middle line of each stanza forming the outer rhymes of the one that follows it. When you come to the end of a thought, thread, or section, you add a fourth line to that stanza and use up the rhyme that would otherwise have gone with the next. I've done this with rhyme and appended the stop line, just why this form has stood the test of time. A young Hopkins used the stop couplet to end his early Tetsa Rima poem, Winter with the Gulf Stream. I see long reefs of violets in beryl-covered ferns so dim. A gold-water pactolus frets its brindle hoves and yellow brim. 
the waxen colours weep and run, and slendering to his burning rim, into the flat blue mist the sun drops out, and the day is done. Chaucer, under Dante's influence, wrote the first English Tatsurima poem, A Complaint to His Lady, but the best-known example in English is probably Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth, and by the incantation of this verse scatter as from an unextinguished hearth ashes and sparks my words among mankind. Be through my lips to unawakened earth the trumpet of a prophecy, O wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? It does not matter how you lay out your verse. Shelley used five fourteen-line stanzas, or in what metre? Hopkins wrote in iambic tetrameter and Shelley in pentameter. It is the rhyme scheme that defines the form. In order of ascending line length, the quatrain comes next. The quatrain is heroic and profound, and glories in the deeds of noble days. Pentameters of grave and mighty sound, like rolling cadences of brass, give praise. Alas, its elegiac counterpart bemoans with baleful woe this world of strife. In graveyards and in tears it plies its art, lamenting how devoid of hope is life. In equal form, the comic quatrain's made, but free to say exactly what it thinks. It's brave enough to call a spade a spade, and dig for truth however much it stinks. There is, of course, no formal difference between those three samples. They're merely produced to show you that quatrains in A-B, A-B have been used for all kinds of purposes in English poetry. Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard is probably the best-known elegiac use quatrains have been put to. Its lines have given the world classic book and film titles, far from the madding crowd and paths of glory, as well as providing some memorably stirring phrases. Forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne and shut the gates of mercy on mankind. A cross-rhymed quatrain, perhaps obviously, allows for fuller development of an image or conceit than can be achieved with couplets. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen, and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Gray's repetition of full many is an example of a rhetorical trope called anaphora, in case you are interested, in case you care, in case you didn't already know, in case of too much anaphora, break glass. Actually, that was epinaphora. The Rubai. From Persia comes a quatrain form called the Rubai, plural Rubaiyat, rhyming A-A-B-A-C-C-D-C-E-E-F-E, -E -E -E, etc. In ancient Persia and Islamic lands, the price of heresy was both your hands. Indeed, the cost could even be your head or burial up to it in the sands. The wiser heads would write a rubai down and pass it quietly round from town to town. Anonymous, subversive and direct, the best examples garnered great renown. Collections of these odes, or rubaiyat, showed sultans where progressive thought was at, distributed by dissidents and wits like early forms of Russian samistat. The rubaiyat of Omar, called Kayam, are quatrains of expansive, boozy charm. As found in Horace, Herrick, and Marvell, the message is, drink, when did wine do harm? Too soon the sun will set upon our tents. Don't waste your time with pious, false laments. Drink deep the wine of life, then drink some more. I never heard a poet make more sense. The translation of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam by Edward Fitzgerald ranks alongside Burton's Arabian Nights as one of the great achievements of English Orientalism. A book of verses underneath the bough, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou beside me singing in the wilderness. O oh, wilderness were paradise enow. Tis all a checkerboard of nights and days, where destiny with men for pieces plays. Hither and thither moves, and mates, and slays, 
and one by one back in the closet lays. The ball no question makes of eyes and nose, but right or left as strikes the player goes. And he that tossed thee down into the field, he knows all about it, he knows, he knows. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. If that kind of poetry doesn't make your bosom heave, then I fear we shall never be friends. Open forms in sextane are less specifically defined in English verse. Wordsworth, in his daffodils, used the verse form Shakespeare developed in Venus and Adonis, essentially a cross-rhymed quatrain closing with a couplet, A, B, A, B, C, C. For oft when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Rhyme Royal Rhyme Royal has a noble history from Geoffrey Chaucer to the present day. Its secret is no hidden mystery. Iambic feet, the classic English way, with B and B to follow A, B, A, this closing couplet, like a funeral hearse, drives to its end the body of the verse. Rhyme Royal is most associated with Geoffrey Chaucer, whose Troilus and Crusade marks the form's first appearance in English. It was once thought that the name derived from its later use by Henry IV, but this is now, like all pleasing stories, from King Alfred's cakes to Mr. Gear's way with gerbils, disputed by scholars. I suppose by rights a seven-line stanza should be called a heptane or septane, but I've never seen either word used. Auden used the A, B, A, B, B, C, C of Rhyme Royal in his Letter to Lord Byron. You would think that he would choose Octava Rima, the form in which the addressee so conspicuously excelled. Auden apologises to his lordship for not doing so. Octava Rima would, I know, be proper, the proper instrument on which to pay my compliments, but I should come a cropper. Rhyme Royal's difficult enough to play. But if no classics as in Chaucer's day, at least my modern pieces shall be cheery, like English bishops on the quantum theory. Auden's reluctance to use Ottava Rima stemmed, one suspects, from its demand for an extra rhyme. I have always loved this form, however, as my sample verse makes clear. Ottava Rima is a poet's dream, the most congenial of forms by far. It's quite my favorite prosodic scheme, and Byron's too, which lends it some eclat. Much more adaptable than it may seem, it plays both classical and rock guitar. It suits romantic lyric inspiration, but I prefer Byronic style deflation. As you just heard, Ottava Rima rhymes A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C and thus presents in eight lines, hence the ottava, as in octave. It is, in effect, rhyme royal with an extra line, but just as one or more gene in the strand of life can make all the difference, so one or more line in a stanza can quite alter the identity of a form. The origins of ottava rima are to be found in Ariosto's epic Orlando Furioso, and it entered English in translations of this and other Italian epics. John Hookham Frere, saw its potential for mock heroic use, and it was through his 1817 work Whistlecraft that Byron came to use the form, first in Beppo, and then in his masterpiece of subverted epic and scattergun satire, Don Juan. As Auden remarks, rhyme royals difficult enough. Two pairs of three rhymes and a couplet per verse. Perverse, indeed. Some of W.B. Yeats's best-loved later poems take the form away from scabrous mock heroics by mixing true rhyme with the sonorous 20th century possibilities opened up by the use of slant rhyme, finding an unexpected lyricism. This is the celebrated last stanza of Among School Children. Labor is blossoming or dancing where the body is not bruised to pleasure soul, nor beauty born out of its own despair nor blear-eyed wisdom out of midnight oil. O oh, chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? 
O oh, body swayed to music, O oh, brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? End of disc four.